We appreciate your presence so very much. Looks like we have a good number here. We're thankful for that. <clears throat> we do have some that are away from us, uh, some that are sick and uh, in need of our prayers. Please pick up a newsletter from the foyer if you haven't done that yet. There's a lot of information in there that uh, might be helpful to you. There's also a little puzzle, Bible puzzle, uh, in the foyer as well. If you miss it in the bulletin, uh, I made some so you can pick one of those up. <clears throat> Let me mention just a few people uh, that are in need of our prayers. Sonny Parker is improving at Floyd Hospital but continues to need our prayers. Virgil Story is in the hospital in Calhoun after having uh, surgery on his leg to remove a recurring infection that he's had uh, on and off since he fell and broke his leg on the ice uh, some years ago. Now they've decided to go in and clean that infection out. He should get to come home. Uh, maybe tomorrow or Tuesday, and so we'll be praying if that is the case. Uh, Susie Lent, Steve's sister, she continues to receive cancer treatments. Uh, Robbie Everstole, uh, Everstole is still hospitalized. He's still, I believe he's still in the ICU and in need of our prayers at uh, Redmond Hospital, and so keep him in your prayers. Uh, talk to Jerry Boswell. He said that uh, Kay Ann uh, only has a good day every once in a while, and so pray for Kay Ann. He also said, uh, told me that since he had COVID, uh, he hasn't been able to taste or smell anything since that time still. And so we want to pray for Jerry as well. Uh, Christy's mom, Deborah Stout, uh, may get to come home tomorrow. We hope and pray that that is the case. Uh, Steve is preparing for a mission trip to the Philippines. And so we want to pray for him as he gets ready. And also learned today that Michelle Gunnels is uh, suffering from a uh, flare-up of diverticulitis for about the last week, and we want to keep her in our prayers in a special way as well. Also, don't forget that our Vacation Bible School is in two weeks from today, and we'll be having a Super Sunday from 2 to 5, classes for all ages, and we'll be studying some of the miracles that Jesus did around the Sea of Galilee. And so that will be, uh, be a fun time for our young people, but a time of learning for all of us. And so come out and join in with us for our Vacation Bible School. Also, don't forget about the school supplies uh, list in the foyer. Bring in your items to donate to families that are in need of school supplies. Also, just a, a quick note, we will not meet tomorrow for lunch and learn, although it's our regular time, we won't meet because of the holiday. And so uh, enjoy that break from lunch and learn. We'll pick it up later this month. Also, pray for Emmanuel George. He will be coming uh, soon to the U.S. for a visit. And we want to pray for him as he prepares and gets ready for that travel. I added a couple to the uh, preacher training list. Uh, all, uh, Mark Garner, who starts his second year there. And also the Mallory family. That includes Caden Mallory, uh, who will also be starting his second year. And Joe and Brennan, that's father and son. They'll be starting their first year very soon. So we want to remember uh, these, these fellows in our prayers as well. I think that's everything that I have. If you have other things that you'd like to have me announce, I'd be glad to do that at the appropriate time. If you have anything for the newsletter, just let me know, and I'll be glad to run things in the newsletter as well. But we're thankful for your presence here. Everybody get a songbook and get ready to join in, and we'll turn it over to our song leader. <coughs> Two hundred thirty eight. Two hundred thirty eight. If you would please stand. Holy, holy, holy.
137. There is my Jesus
scripture reading this morning will be from Isaiah 35, verse 8. Isaiah 35, verse 8. A highway shall be there, and a road. It shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come before your majestic throne of grace, we praise you, Father, for your word and your son. We thank you for your love. We thank you for each soul here today and in the sound of our voice. We, we have come to worship you in truth and in spirit, to lift your name above all names, to thank you for our precious Savior who went to Calvary in our place. We pray, Father, that this worship would be to lift your name up, to worship you in the spirit and truth as you would have us to as we find the exact example for worship in your word. We thank you for our brother Rick and his family, for the lessons that he teaches us from your word, and we thank you for his study. Father, today we have many who are sick. We, we pray for these, Father. We're thankful that Skip and Danny are back after a battle of illness. We pray for Michelle Gomes, Sandy Jerome, Brian Owens, Jackie's son, who has cancer. We pray for Mr. and Ms. Hyde, this is Diane's mom and dad who have fallen on the old times. We pray for Chad's stepbrother, Mark Dorsett, who has cancer. We pray for Chrissy and her mother, Miss Stout. We pray that she continues to improve. We pray for Steve as he's preparing for a trip the Philippines. Pray for Emmanuel George as he is preparing to come here from India. Father, we pray for Jerry and Kay Ann. Pray that you would strengthen them. We pray for Robbie Eversold, who's in ICU. We pray for Steve's sister and her family, Susie Lentz. Father, we pray for Virgil and Patricia as he's undergone surgery. We pray that he'll continue to get better where he can come home. We pray for Sonny and Lynn Parker who are going through a tough time. Also, with Sonny being in the hospital. Father, we know there are many more. It disappoints us when we omit a name. But Father, we know that, that you don't forget anyone. You know us all. You know every need that we have, every pain that we have, every mental anguish that we have. Father, we know there have been so many families throughout this nation and in this state and county that have gone through great pains of COVID. And now they're going through great pains, financial pains of a troubled economy. Father, we know that sometimes this can negatively, unfortunately, affect us spiritually. But Father, as we study in our Bible study lesson this morning, that we understand our life is but a vapor. We're here for a very short while. Father, may we always focus on what is most important, not what seems important. Father, we know that serving you, obeying you, loving you, and loving each and every soul in this world 
doing what you say, Father, obeying you. Obeying you because we love you. We respect you. We revere you. And we thank you for our precious Jesus. May we worship with the right attitude. May we give with the right attitude. Please be with us, Father, in Jesus' name. I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Before the Lord's Supper, 384. 384. Supper. I want to make sure everyone has picked up a communion cup. If you did not get one, Ray can get one to you. Just raise your hand. Anyone? <coughs> a number of times in the New Testament, we read of something that God did from the foundation of the world. Sometimes it will say before the foundation of the world. The foundation of the world simply refers to God's creation before time, when time began, he created everything. But if God did something before the foundation of the world, it means that he did it before he created anything. It was something that he did in his mind as he was planning things. 
One such example of that is our salvation. And we see this in 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20, if you'd like to see this. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. Peter writes, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received from the, by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God. That's an amazing statement. It says before God created man, before he created this earth, really before he created time as we know it, he knew that our salvation would require something that was the most precious thing that uh, that he could create really and so apparently there was a cross in the mind of God before there was anything else. Before he created anything. As God planned for your salvation and mine before, of course, long before any of us existed, before he created this earth, he knew that our salvation would require the most precious element he could, uh, he could find. It would require more than all the silver and gold that he would embed into the core of this earth. And it would take something uh, pure, incorruptible, undefiled, something that had no spot or blemish. Talking about our salvation. Finally, God settled in his mind, his infinite mind, what it would take. And he decided there was only one commodity, one element, if you will, that would do. And that was the precious blood of his own son. This is about the death of Christ. What we're doing here has to do with the death of Christ what it took for our salvation. And fortunately for us, Jesus was willing to accept this plan that God came up with before the foundation of the world. Not only because it was the perfect plan, but ultimately it was the only plan that would work. And so as we come together to remember the death of our Savior Jesus and what he went through. We need to we need to understand that uh, when it took something as precious as the blood of Jesus that should remind us of how how awful sin is that it would require such a price as that. Let's give thanks. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to come together and worship thee, and especially for this time that we uh, set aside to remember the death of your son Jesus on the cross. We're thankful, Father, that you were willing to devise a plan by which we could be saved long before we existed, even before the foundation of this world. 
Help us to understand, Father, that the cross of Jesus was not a mistake. It was not an accident. It was not an afterthought. It was something planned by you from the beginning. We thank you now for this bread, which represents the, the body of your son, Jesus, which was given in our, in our behalf. Bless us as we partake of it. We ask in Jesus' name. Again, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to remember what your son Jesus did for us in giving his life on the cross. We're thankful for this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood shed for our sins. Help us to realize that without the shedding of, of your son's blood, there could be no remission of our sins. So help us not to ever take this lightly or take it for granted, but to recognize that this emblem represents the most precious thing that uh, you could imagine even in your own mind that was uh, good enough to redeem us from our sins. Bless us now as we partake. In Jesus' name. sake we'll also use this time to uh, think about uh, thank God for the blessings of our lives and to give and we have the contribution played out in the foyer if you did not give uh, on your way in you can do that on, on the way out let's uh, give thanks though father there's no way we can thank you enough for the blessings of this life for our very existence and for your infinite plan that allows for us to live uh, this life in a way that is pleasing to thee and with the hope and the confidence of being with you throughout, throughout eternity. We thank you though for the material things that you provide us with in this life, make our lives comfortable thankful for the jobs that you allowed us to have and for the incomes that we have we can give so that your work can continue and spread throughout this community and throughout the world please bless us always in our uh, in our efforts to give back to thee we ask in jesus name It's on 255. 255. Someone with encouragement after Brother Rick brings us the lesson to that. And if you would, uh, let us all sing 154. 154. 
on my telephone. Last week I traveled somewhere I hadn't been before or at least in a long time. I traveled a road I had never been down and so I used my GPS to help me find figure out which way I was going. Did you ever notice when you pull up the map on your phone and type in an address to where you're going that uh, one of the buttons there is a little fellow with a hiking stick and I accidentally pushed that button. And it said, uh, it's going to take you 24 hours to walk down there. <laughs> and I thought, that's a pretty optimistic view if you think I'm walking with <laughs> in 24 hours. You know, the blessing was I didn't have to walk. I could drive on the highway. And because of that, I didn't have to walk 24 hours. I just jumped in my car where it was comfortable and climate controlled and got there and what seemed like no time at all. We're spoiled, aren't we? When we get to drive on the highway, we take it for granted. I was talking to somebody recently who went out west and one of their destinations was miles and miles and miles down a dirt road. That's a whole different story, isn't it? When you're not on the highway, travel can get sticky sometimes. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes this morning about the highway that we're traveling on as Christians. I appreciate Brother Eric reading that passage in Isaiah chapter 35, verse number 8, where the prophet says, A highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. You know, I, all I have to do to get to Atlanta is jump on the interstate and make sure I'm headed south. 
And then, you don't have to be that smart, just don't get off until you get where you're going. So what, this is what Isaiah is describing here in, in Isaiah chapter 35. Of course, he's not talking about a literal highway. He's talking about a figurative highway that God was going to build for us to travel where we need to go. We're on the highway, ultimately, that's headed toward heaven. And what a blessing that is. Amen. Another one of the prophets that mentions this highway is Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse number 21. Jeremiah is talking to a people who needed to repent and get back on the highway. They had got off of the highway. Listen to what he says. Set thee up waymarks. Make thee high heaps. Set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to these thy cities. God's telling his people, you were on the highway, but you got off. It's time to repent and get back on. What a blessing to be able to travel the highway as Christians. You know, Christianity is the highway that we're talking about today. It's interesting that throughout the entire New Testament, the Bible describes Christianity as a road, a path that we're traveling. Jesus even described himself that way, didn't he? In uh, John 14, verse number 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. That word way there literally means road or path. Jesus says, I am the path. If you want to take the highway, you've got to be in Jesus. Paul described Christianity this way. In Acts chapter 9, in verse number 2, the Bible says there that he went to uh, the Jewish leaders and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues. Notice, this is what Paul's letter said. Saul of Tarsus, when he traveled to Damascus to look for Christians, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men and women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. In other words, Saul said, when I leave Jerusalem and get to Damascus, I'll know they're Christians by the highway that they're on. If I find any on this way, I'll throw them in jail. I'll make them repent, come back to Judaism, or I'll, or I'll kill them, one or the other. Acts chapter 22 and verse number 4, I know that was his intention because of what he said here in Acts 22 when he retold that story. He said, I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. This way, this highway, this path that these Christians were traveling on. I found them and I destroyed them. The Bible describes this way that we're traveling on as a way that is high. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 14, Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This calling that we have is high. It's not a low calling. It's God wanting the best for us. He wants us to raise, he wants to raise us up above the world in a sense and take the high road. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 6, the Bible says that Christ has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You see how he raises us up to the highway of Christianity? And that's where he wants us to walk. Romans 6 and verse number 4, the Bible says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. So as Christ was raised, so are Christians raised. 
up to this highway. Colossians 2 and verse number 12. The Bible says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith in the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. We're risen. We're raised up. We're lifted up to the highway that God wants us to travel on. You know, a sad fact is that a lot of times when you're driving on the highway, you look on the side, you see a whole bunch of litter and trash. I talked to a friend of mine one time and I said he was a truck driver and delivered propane most of his life. And I was asking him about the interstate between uh, Memphis and Little Rock. How's that, how's that road? And he said, well, I tell you what, you could walk from Memphis to Little Rock on the back of the alligators. He's talking about those tires laying in the road, you know, with the trucks, retreads that come off. There's dangerous things on the road. Pollution and trash and old tires and who knows what all. But this highway that we're traveling is free from that kind of pollution. We're traveling on a clean highway. Hebrews chapter 20, uh, chapter 10, rather, in verse number 20, the Bible says, By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. This path we're on is a new path, a living path. And so the idea there is it's like driving on a highway that nobody's ever been down to litter, nobody's ever trashed it before. It's clean, this highway that we're traveling on. And the church has on traveling on this highway has got to keep that way clean. We can't be litter bugs on this highway. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. The Bible warns about the pollution that we can engage in as Christians. And he says, Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Sometimes people miss the they miss the figurative language there because they're not that familiar with baking and cooking like they were in ancient times. Leaven was the yeast that they used to make the bread rise. And he said. You have to make sure that you get rid of the leaven. It's a picture of sin. Because he said if a little bit of yeast gets in the dough, it'll spread through the whole dough and make it all rise. That's the way sin works. It'll get in your life and it'll spread through your whole life. It won't stay in one little spot. It's like that leaven in the dough. And so it's so important for us to keep our lives clean. And the Bible says that we can, among other reasons, because we are cleansed by the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 26. In this chapter, Paul is talking about the love that Christ had for the church, and he is using an illustration of the way husbands are supposed to love their wives, the way we're supposed to love our families. And he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And so there's an interesting phrase here. We're washed by water. I think he's alluding to the waters of baptism there. Because that's when our sins are washed away. But we wouldn't know that we need to be washed in the waters of baptism if it weren't for the Word to teach us that. And so the Word, then, is a cleansing agent. I remember when Jesus spoke to his disciples and he said, Now ye are clean through the Word that I have spoken unto you. This was before baptism had been instituted, by the way. The church had not yet come into existence. But he told the apostles... You're clean by the word that I have spoken to you. Of course, the ultimate cleansing power is in the blood of Jesus. Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible says, But if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. The blood of Jesus is what cleanses us. I'm thankful that we have a clean highway and we can keep it clean by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, verse number 22, the Bible says, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. And so our sins then are purged by the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1, verse 5 says, that who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so we've been cleansed. This way has been cleansed and we've got to keep it clean. We've got to do our best to remain clean. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20, Peter is warning Christians here about allowing pollution to creep back into their lives. And he says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. And then in the next verses he talks about uh, some illustrations. The dog returning to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire to show what it's like for a Christian who has been cleansed to go back into the filth and pollution of sin. God's cleaned us up from that. He's washed us and put us on the highway. And we're supposed to keep it clean. James 1 and verse number 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. On this highway, we can't be polluted with sins any longer. We've been washed, we've been cleaned, and we need to keep this highway clean. Yes. I'm thankful we're on the highway, but I want you to notice that we've got to choose to be on this highway, and we've got to choose to stay on this highway. What does that mean? Well. In the negative sense, it means there are certain things that we can't do. Certain things that we can't engage in. Number one, no filthy minds. The Bible says in Philippians 4 and verse number 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. What does he say? Keep your minds pure. Don't get involved in the pollutions of the world. There's so many ways the devil has to get the pollution of sin into your life, into your mind. Music, movies, television, books. Just the culture in our world is often something that is filthy. And too often Christians don't give much thought to letting those kinds of things in their minds. Once you get it in, it's impossible to get out. The harder you wish you could forget a thing, the more it's in your mind rolling around. And so, no filthy minds. Also, no filthy mouths. Ephesians 4 and verse number 20, uh, 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouths, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. No corruption out of our mouths. We let it in through our minds, and often it will come back out through our mouths. Christians have got to watch what they say. Keep their speech pure. Why? Because we're on a clean highway, and we've got to keep it that way. No filthy ways. You know, Jude uh, talks about this in uh, uh, verses leading up to verses 20 and 21. He talks about those false teachers who allow themselves to be controlled by their sensual natures. And then he warns this. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 
Don't allow yourself to be controlled by the sensual lusts of the flesh, of the mind. Instead, focus on spiritual things. Let your mind be engaged in, in clean things so that we don't pollute this way that we're on. No filthy minds, no filthy mouths, no filthy ways. But then, Christianity is not just a religion of not doing things, not doing bad things. It's also a religion of doing that which is right. And so, the positive side of keeping ourselves clean. Colossians 1, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So what's interesting is, God then takes us as sinners and washes us clean through obedience, our obedience to the gospel and Jesus' application of his blood to our lives. He washes us and cleanses us and puts us up on the highway. And then he says, keep your sights set even higher. You think on things above. You set your affection on things above and that will keep the highway clean. Hebrews 2, uh, Hebrews 12 rather, verse number 2, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I encourage you to look to Jesus. Consider Jesus, as Steve said, what he did for you, the sacrifice that he made for you, the fact that he died on the cross for your sins. Think about Jesus. Fill your mind, fill your time, fill your thoughts with thoughts about Jesus. Tell people about him. Teach people about his way, about his plan, about his church. Those are positive things that we can do to keep our minds clean and focused on the right thing and to make sure that we stay on this high way. You know, we choose whether we take the high road or the low road. God has created us all with the power to choose. Free moral agents. You can choose the high road, or sadly, you can choose the low road. It's up to you. But you need to know that those are the only two choices. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. We're talking about the highway here. Jesus says there's only two ways. One is mentioned in verse number 13. It's called the broad way. That's the low way, by the way. And then in verse number 14, he says there's a narrow way. That's the highway. That's the way that leads to heaven. Now the choice is up to you, but there's only two choices. The high road and the low road. Most of the world's on the low road, I'm sad to say. If you don't believe that, just open your eyes and look around. And you can see that most people are on the low road. Those who have obeyed the gospel. He's put us on the highway. And we need to make sure that we put forth the effort to stay there. Because that's the way it leads to heaven. I pray that this lesson has helped you make the right choices. To stay on that highway that leads to heaven when this life is over and the judgment is passed. If you're not a Christian, we would plead with you to get on that highway. The Lord will put you on if you'll respond properly to the gospel call. The gospel calls for everyone. 
The Lord wants everybody to be saved. But your salvation is determined by your response to that call. Hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Believe in Jesus as the Son of God, John 3, 16. Have enough faith to repent of your sins, Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. Come forward confessing the name of Christ, just like the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. And then be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. That's what it takes to get started on the highway. When you obey the gospel, the Lord will forgive you of your sins, and he will add you to his church. And you can begin that Christian walk on the highway. In order to stay there, you've got to remain faithful unto death to receive the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And so whether you're here today as a person who's never obeyed the gospel and needs to do that, or you're here as a Christian and you realize you've fallen off the highway, it's time to get back on through repentance and prayer. And we can help you any way that we can. We are willing to and will if you'll let us know of your need as together we stand and as we sing. I